Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I'm at NASA Ames because they have this ginormous big plane here. This is, of course, SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. It is a converted 747, which carries a 2.5 meter infrared telescope in its back. It uh, is an amazing piece of hardware. It's like having a space telescope, except that it's bigger and you can change the hardware, the sensors, the instruments on the back of it. So I'm going to get a chance to look inside. Most amateur plane spotters will instantly recognize the Sophia as a 747 with its characteristic hump. However, it is uncharacteristically stubby. That's because it's a 747 SP. SP is for special performance. It's a lighter, smaller 747 based upon the original 747-100 from the 1970s. So the airframe is about 16 meters shorter. The uh, It weighs about 20 tons less. Its tail is about an extra half meter uh, long. And overall, it gets about a, an extra thousand miles of range. And this was actually requested by Pan Am and Iran Air because they wanted to do flights between the US and the Middle East. In fact, Sophia was originally delivered to Pan Am and christened the Clipper Lindbergh. Clipper Lindbergh. This plane's like almost as old as me. Yeah. Right? 77. That's when, uh, that's when I saw Star Wars. And it Changed who I am. <laughs> I'm so excited. So the plane is laid out with passenger seats at the front for takeoff and landing. There's a work area in the middle with all the technical consoles, and at the back you have the telescope focal plane, and behind that wall there is the telescope itself. These are big heavy consoles. I mean I guess it doesn't matter, you want these things to be heavy since they're counteracting the weight of that thing, right? So um, so th these are the guys, this is the mission director here, right? And this person is going to be looking at what the how the observations are going, but they're also going to be aware of the weather situation, where the pilot is. They're going to be talking directly. Do they like listening on air traffic control or? They're listening to every, at all of these stations on board. Uh -huh. If, for example, on a certain start flight path, this is an example. If, um, our plan is to time to say 40,000 feet, yeah. but air traffic control tells the pilots that we have to say 38. The pilots can really that. So. And so they might have to make an on the fly change to an observing schedule based on we might other things? We have to be flexible with the altitude. Yeah. So the, uh, we can replan flights like, during flights, but um, we have to refile that with air traffic control. So if, if we can stick to our mm -hmm. original plan, right. then that's what we're going to do. So, so one thing I like is that. Uh, these consoles, you know, they all just look like mission control consoles until you look down here and you see oxygen masks, right? That's how you know that you're actually on a plane and you might need to deal with all sorts of eventualities. The whole thing does have a real mission control kind of vibe to it with several sets of consoles covering different parts. And because they're flying through the air and it's loud, everybody has headsets and every table, there's a way to select which loops you want to be listening on and talking on. And this, well, this is the instrument rack. On the far side of this wall is the actual telescope itself. So this wall isn't just a pressure wall, it's a structural part where the spherical bearing that sits in the middle, the light passes through the middle of that to get to the instruments here. And it's very important that the instruments on this side be positioned and have masses so that they exactly match the mass on the other side. If you get that balance perfectly, then almost all of the stabilization required is entirely passive. It stays in the correct orientation just due to its own moment of inertia. When people hear about Sophia, they think that there must be a huge amount of hardware actively controlling the telescope to keep it pointed. But the truth is, most of the pointing is actually maintained by passive stabilization. The entire structure is built like a dumbbell with both sides perfectly balanced. That means that any acceleration on the structure doesn't produce a net rotation or torque. So as the airplane moves, the telescope will naturally stay still. Can you explain how this telescope actually moves? We know how it's stable, but then you actually need to move it onto targets. So. Yes, so there's a, a multi-layer system that stabilizes the telescope. And the first system, the first layer on the outside is an air spring system that dampens lower frequencies. 
Um, then you have a coarse drive that moves the telescope in elevation, so we can look at targets of 20 degrees elevation up to 70 degrees elevation, roughly. And then uh, uh, inside the uh, bearing, there's a, hydro, this a hydrostatic bearing. Um, the telescope floats on a thin oil film, and there's uh, electromagnetic torque drives and uh, permanent magnets that can move the whole telescope in uh, three degrees in each axis. Just by pushing like induced currents onto the... Yes. yes. That's really clever. So you don't... The bearing is perfectly smooth. There's nothing that projects out. Therefore, yes. it, yeah. it, it but, moves beautifully. And you said you can move this whole thing when it's unlocked with your, just your fingers? Yes. When the telescope is perfectly balanced, uh, the whole 17 tons can be moved by hand. So the whole telescope assembly weighs about 17 tons. And as I said, it has to be kept perfectly balanced, which is not as trivial as you would imagine because the instruments can be swapped out depending upon the requirements of the mission. And you know, teams will build their own custom instruments. And that means that when they're installed, they have to go through a process of balancing, adding extra weights, and we can see many of these plates bolted onto the instrument in strategic places. To achieve the accurate pointing needed for astronomical observations, they have a visible light camera that acts as a star tracker. This actually uses the same primary and secondary mirror, but the infrared mirror is a dichroic mirror which reflects infrared but passes through the visible light. So then there's a second visible light mirror that sends it off to the star tracker. But this camera in itself, which you can see here, is actually a useful instrument depending upon the observations you're doing. For example, it's used in many occultation surveys, such as this one in 2015 where they observed Pluto eclipsing a distant star and were able to collect information on Pluto's thin atmosphere. Catching a planetary occultation in an aircraft is much harder than you'd think. It's not just a case of having to calculate where the shadow will be. You have to make sure your flight plan is inside that, but also the aircraft has limited range that it can move its telescope. So the flight plan has to incorporate that. The telescope looks out the left side of the aircraft and has a range of down to about 20 degrees and up to 70 degrees. So while crossing the path with the shadow, Pluto also had to be at the correct altitude and direction so that they could observe it. And this actually leads to very, very complicated flight plans for the entire campaign. They have to fly with the target off to the left side in a straight line for long enough to get the data. Uh, and that may require them not turning very slowly as well to track the rotation. Beyond that, some of the observations require them to be at a specific altitude. So they might have to leave those observations until later in the flight. And then they have to leave enough fuel so that they can get back home. If you ask me, trying to optimize for all these criteria would make for an excellent video game. And of course, the air crews responsible for flying these routes are still flying in a cockpit built in the 1970s. It still has the classic engineer's console here because we don't have all the automated systems that we expect on modern aircraft. The, there is a glass upgrade. They've got a lot of their instrumentation replaced by electronics, but the yokes and the throttles are very old. The engineer's console does have the switches to control the door, of course. That, of course, is something that isn't touched unless the mission director tells you to open it. And when you do open it, you're opening a chunk of the aircraft to a near supersonic airstream. And the aircraft barely notices. Unsurprisingly, NASA did a lot of testing on the aerodynamics and the door sticks out intentionally because the lip of the door there actually creates airflow that pushes the air over the cavity so it doesn't spill into it. Because first of all, that would ruin the aerodynamics of the aircraft, but also it would make it very hard for the telescope to maintain pointing. Even then, about 1% of the airflow spills into the cavity, and that's one of the big problems that they have to deal with in terms of vibration. It's a kind of vibration the telescope detects, not what the passengers detect. Unless you're told that they are opening the door, you won't feel anything, apparently. Anyway, with all the modifications, there's one thing that I had expected that I was surprised to find they didn't have. I thought the 
crew would have some sort of cockpit display to tell them what course to hold so that they could hold it within you know one degree. It turns out they just get the heading radioed up from downstairs by the mission director and they have to kind of follow his commands. While upstairs, I also ran into James Jackson, the associate director for research, and he was the perfect person to ask, what is Sophia being used for? What research is it doing? What instrument is it using to do this? What instruments do we actually have on there right now, and what are they targeted? So right at the moment, we have a mid-infrared imager called Forecast. Okay. But we have a bunch of instruments, and we, we take advantage. So the, the, it's absolutely black. The sky is absolutely black from the ground. So we can get up to stratospheric altitudes. We can actually see through the haze of the atmosphere and actually get this radiation. The instruments we have are fall into a couple of categories. There's basic imagers, where you just take a picture of things on the sky, um, or a spectrometer. And this takes a spectrum, like you know, sending the light through a prism is an analogy, right? So you analyze the light as a function of frequency or wavelength. Um, we have a spectrometer called um, Great. That's our workhorse instrument. That's probably the most popular. We have an imager called Hawk uh, that does uh, far infrared. And we have Forecast. And we have an, another uh, spectrometer called Exus, which is um, shorter wavelengths. Now, the. So the spectrometers are covering different wavelength ranges. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Now, the we've added a new wrinkle to our repertoire. We now have a polarimeter. So we can measure the polarization of light. And that tells you how the magnetic fields are mm -hmm. threading through these dust clouds or these gas clouds. So Hawk does polarization as well, and that's a that's a new capability that we're really okay. having. We get any interesting targets for that? Oh, lots of interesting lots, targets. Well, yeah. You're not going to specify? <laughs> well, Orion, for instance, the Galactic Center. Oh, one of my favorites. The Galactic Center. Um, yeah. We're looking at infrared, these snaky filamentary clouds called infrared dark clouds. Yeah. And we, the basic question still is not answered. Does the magnetic field go this way with respect to the filament? Or that way, perpendicular or parallel. What Sophia's finding is more or less perpendicular, which is a bit of a surprise. Oh, okay. yeah. see, now I'm going to have to actually read up on that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really grateful to Enrico and Cassandra for arranging this behind the scenes look. I mean, some of the areas I got into weren't part of the regular tour, so I was very happy to get up close and look at some of the telescope hardware. Like, I love the fact that that telescope moves around and there's a 19-inch rack just hanging off the side of that thing as it wobbles around. To the casual observer, it might look unwieldy, but the truth is it is literally perfectly balanced as all things should be. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.